I have struggled with gut issues, so this topic is very near and dear to me. And I've, you know, been fortunate enough to really get healed, really through a whole food plant-based diet. I followed this for a very long time. I've been pretty much plant-based for almost 30 years or so. Started out as a vegetarian, and so it can be done. Um, I think all of you probably know that already. Here are our, our objectives, our topics that we're gonna discuss. Um, getting into gut health, really what happens when things go awry, and then how do we fix it, okay? So gut health, why is it important Microbiome, microbiota, what is that? Okay, so that's what we're really gonna focus on right now. And why does it even matter? We know here is the um, hot spots of microbial activity in our body, oral cavity, the mouth, no surprise there. But also as we go along, we just heard about skin, large portions of these microbes live in our skin and not surprisingly in our gut, okay? So small intestine, about 22 feet, they don't have the most microbes. Where the most microbes you know, really exist is in this five feet of your large intestine and that colon, okay? And this is, as they say, where all the magic happens. So when we eat, Food is digested, it's broken down, it's absorbed, and then in our, in our gut, in that colon, you've got this large population of, of bacteria that work to you know, metabolize and they start to ferment, okay? We're gonna talk a lot about fermentation and how this is so helpful for our gut and the lining of our gut and can lead to gut health, all right? Um, this whole process, um, you know, of, of food going down, um, those microbes that we have, it really starts, you know, at birth. Um, I'm working in, uh, you know, a women's health section right now in, in the hospital setting. And, you know, all I can think about is little babies as they're coming into the world, you know, if they're coming in more naturally, they're being given their mother's, you know, microbes. And so that's super important in how, you know, our interaction with the environment and how that helps to develop those microbial uh, little organism friends. The other thing I want you to kind of think about is that there are up to 100 billion cells per gram, okay, of these microbes living in our body. I think that's so, so, so incredible. And as researchers really began to kind of look at this topic, um, they realized like, wow, this is not just, we have a few little microbes living on us, but they're doing so, so, so much for our health, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some of these. So what do these microbes do for our gut? Well, we know they metabolize some of our food. So when we eat fiber, we've talked a lot about fiber today, those carbohydrates, that's the good stuff for our body, okay? Um, fiber is really digested by those microbes in the colon, and they produce something called short-chain fatty acids. Lots of big words, okay? But really what I want you to think about is that is a fuel for the colon, okay? So that's what your, your colon cells actually use as an energy source. Um, and without it, when, when we don't have that fiber, what happens is that those microbes can actually start to eat your, the lining of your gut. That's when all of these problems start to arise. So we're gonna get into some of those problems in a little bit. Um, but we also know those microbes, they produce things for us like vitamins, they activate um, certain things. Um, and you know, we know also that the immune system is greatly impacted by uh, these microbes. About 70% of our microbe, or, or excuse me, our immune system is in our gut. A lot of people don't re realize that. But that relationship between our immune system, the health, the strength, is also very, very tightly correlated um, with that microbial community. So they're kind of like helping each other out. It's this nice little relationship. And they may help to identify um, you know, pathogenic bacteria that live in our gut, okay? So they're, they're, they should be helping us. It can, can go wrong sometimes, but hopefully um, we're gonna talk about ways to make sure that it goes right. Um, and then overall health. So, you know, kind of the protection and overall health I like to pair together. But really those microbes, um, you know, something that I think is very uh, prominent right now is this concept of leaky gut. 
And really what that's referring to is this gut barrier, this gut integrity. The lining of our, our gut, our GI, um, is very thin, okay? And so if we don't have fiber, if those, those microbes don't have anything to eat, can really start to cause havoc, you know? Um, we don't want things going into our intestines that shouldn't be there. We don't want stuff floating in and out that shouldn't be there. It's like if you build a house, you want those walls to be, you know, really sturdy. You don't want holes because you don't want bugs coming in or, or um, you know, the weather and the elements. It's the same with our gut. So fiber, great, helps with gut integrity. And then um, also we can have those healthy bacteria really help to colonize the gut and so that it kind of, you know, pushes out those bad bacteria, okay? Um, so here are some common digestive issues and, um, you know, all of them, the link here, no surprise, this, you know, dysbiosis. So what we eat impacts every single one of these things on this list. And these are really disruptive. I think a lot of people don't realize like how much, um, you know, some of these things can cause havoc in, in people's lives. Some of these conditions and diseases, constipation can happen to little kids. It happens as we get older, anywhere in between. Um, things like diverticular disease. So this is a, you know, something that we see a lot of the time because of a fiber depleted diet. So that's also super important. We've talked about, um, you know, in previous uh, sessions today, um, the link between, you know, red meat and, and poor health. Well, this is one of the main contributing factors to why we get colon cancer. It's also very costly. GERD or reflux, we know 100% that that's related to the things that we consume. Um, and then irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel disease, all of these are pro-inflammatory states that really start you know, because of the things that we eat in, in our gut. And I love this statistic. I think that's, it's very interesting that, you know, again, almost 50% of the people in this country have some kind of gut issue, um, and it really stems from that, what we call dysbiosis. And we're gonna talk about that right now. So anybody heard dysbiosis? We know what that is? No? Okay, a few of us. So really it's this imbalance of these bacteria that live in our gut, okay? Um, we get, you know, a, a more pro-inflammatory state, and dysbiosis leads to dysfunction, i.e. some of those disease states and, and um, harmful conditions that um, I just showed you a couple of seconds ago. So let's talk about what happens when things don't go right. Well, I love this schematic. I think this shows that, you know, when things are not going right in the gut, it doesn't just stay in the gut. It impacts every single thing in our body from our brain, so we have got the gut-brain axis, which we'll talk about here in a second, but to our lungs. So this is what was happening in COVID. You know, we saw a lot of GI issues because of this, this relationship that microbes have to every part of our body. Um, metabolism, Dr. Garth Davis talked about obesity. Um, we know, again, that those microbes are doing things for our body. Um, metabolizing and if they don't have the right foods you know that can cause some issues with you know sugar with type 2 diabetes and whatnot and then absolutely we know heart disease there are microbes that will produce compounds um, TMAO is the word as the the compound but that can impact our heart our, our, our development of heart disease okay so that comes from eating red meat if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you don't have those microbes living in your intestines, okay? The type of foods that you eat influence the type of bacteria that will then populate your gut and live in your gut. And then obviously, um, as the, the doctor previously mentioned, 100% our, our skin um, is related to that, that gut microbiome, okay? So these are some of the conditions with dysbiosis. So here, are some of the things that cause dysbiosis. And I don't have time to go over all of these. I wish I could. I think it's super fascinating, all of the really cool things that we're learning. Um, but let's kind of focus on diet. So we know that when we have a very, very high fat, really this, this saturated fat is what causes a whole bunch of problems. So it leads to this dysbiosis, things like the ketogenic diet, eating more meat, butter, you know, you name it, just wreaks havoc on our gut. So the microbes that live in our GI are, you know, really, really influenced by 
um, our lifestyle and, and whatnot, foods, and that change can happen within 24 hours, which I think is very surprising. So very, very quick for things to happen. Western diet, again, fiber depleted. So it's not, it's, it's, you know, lack of all of these veggies, all of these whole grains, things that we know that promote the, the health of our gut. And this is really just another schematic from a research article, but, but what the big thing I want you to think about is that at retirement, and it's a, a European uh, article, um, so they spell retirement a little, a little funny, but that's really when we start to see the changes in the microbiome. So you lose diversity in those microbial organisms that live in your gut somewhere around that time. So it's super important to increase the, the number of different you know, plants that we eat and really focus on maybe getting outside in, in fresh air, um, all of those lifestyle things that we know are so good as we get older. So here's that gut-brain axis that I told you about. I think it's one of the most fascinating things. It's often referred to as this super you know, communication highway within our body. But basically what's going on is we've got the brain, we've got the gut, and there is a major nerve, the cranial nerve um, 10, so it's the vagus nerve, that kind of facilitates the communication. It's the highway, so to speak. And what happens is that those nerves really come in contact with the lining of the gut wall. And what happens then is that the brain is able to communicate signals down to the gut. Those short chain fatty acids that are produced by those gut microbiota then you know, can actually go travel through the body. Um, we know that different compounds are made and that can cross what we call the, the blood brain barrier. Okay, that's kind of like you're a bouncer for your brain. Um, it really keeps things out that shouldn't be there. Um, but, but because you know, those microbes are producing things that are so helpful, they can sometimes you know, get through, so to speak. Um, and so we know that having some of these bad bacteria, so in particular H. pylori, um, you know, E. coli, those kinds of things, really can be related to some of these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. What I think is also interesting with Parkinson's is that um, you know, a lot of these, these individuals have constipation issues. They have a lot of gut issues before we even know that they've been, you know, there's a diagnosis. Moral of the story, eat more plants because that is what supports this healthy gut, which then can influence our brain. This is also a, a picture of the gut. So we see the microbes at the top. This middle kind of U shape is the lining of the gut wall, okay? And what happens is when we start to eat these really inflammatory foods, we know the Western diet, red meats, these AGEs, those things, they produce inflammatory compounds, okay? And so then what happens is this vicious cycle. We eat bad we get more inflammation, it damages that lining of the gut, and so on and so forth, we've got damage and dysbiosis and all of the other bad health outcomes that ensue. So what's the solution? It's fiber. So why is fiber actually so good for us? And I, I alluded to this already, but it's this, this, really this energy source for the microbes in our gut. And I'm making this very, very simple, but really think about soluble fiber as like this thick gel. You know, it's, it's, it's very um, slow moving in the gut. And it's one of the things that we see is, is maybe associated with some uh, cholesterol lowering. You need to eat enough of it though. And then it can also impact your blood sugar in a, in a, in a good way, okay? Insoluble fiber is really like the broom. It comes through and sweeps things along. Okay, you need them both. Foods have a little bit of both. So it's not like one food has you know, one and that you need to eat this particular type of food. They, they have a combo. Sometimes one has a little bit more or less than the other. And I've given you some examples. Really, a lot of times people will say, well, can I just take a supplement? No, food is best, right? I think everybody in this room understands that. Get it from the food. Both of these are gonna really help. And this 30 grams is kind of like the minimum. I've done you know, my, my nutrition and, and worked out. Sometimes I'm somewhere like 60 grams of fiber a day. I mean, it's possible, right? Like if you eat whole foods, if you eat plants, that's what we're getting and we're feeding our gut.
Okay. And then the pre and probiotics. Um, prebiotics are basically these soluble fibers again. These are what are digested by the uh, bacteria that live in our gut, okay? And they are in particular uh, responsible for that, that butyrate that is produced, okay? And great sources, I think everybody loves garlic and leeks and onions, so these are, are really good things. Eat a variety, I think that's the overall take home message. And then what about probiotics? I feel like that's something that everybody you know, wants to know, should I take a probiotic? Is that something I need to go run out and buy? And my answer is not necessarily. There are certain circumstances that warrant a probiotic, but for the most part, you can do the same thing with fermented foods, okay? So sauerkraut and miso and tempeh, kombucha. If you do need a probiotic, here are some helpful strands, but really there's no guarantee that it's gonna reach the gut. Um, you know, it's gotta pass the stomach and get through all that stomach acid. Um, and then, you know, are those bacteria even alive when they're in a pill or, you know, drink? We don't really know, okay? So probiotics, best from food. And just another reiteration, uh, plants, fiber, good, you know, red meat, uh, refined carbohydrate, Sugar, not so good, okay? So overall, what do we need to do every single day? And it is really this whole food plant-based diet that is the secret weapon to gut health. In addition to all of the fiber that I was talking about, we also get phytochemicals, okay? And these are these, these literally plant chemicals that um, act as antioxidants to not just our gut cells, but the entire body. Okay, we kind of talked about some of these already, um, but they do amazing things acting as like detoxifiers and all kinds of really cool things in, inside. I love this. A lot of people will always say like, oh, do you have like a, an easy, what's your top three? And this is from Dr. Joel Furman, um, his G-bombs for gut health. And you know, honestly, if you don't love onions or you don't love mushrooms, just put something else in. They're all gonna be good for you, okay? You also get all of these lovely, amazing, uh, vitamins and minerals from a plant-based diet with the caveat of maybe B12. Okay, that one is something I would probably say you need to supplement, but look at all of the overlap. Um, I think a lot of people get really bogged down in like, oh, do I need to get, you know, X number of grams of this and that. Eat a variety. That is how you, you really do get all of your nutrition. So we've talked about, you know, the, the, the fiber and all of these things, but what do Americans actually eat? And this is kind of sad. I don't think this surprises anybody in this room. Only one in 10 of Americans actually get the recommended veggies, the fiber, the good stuff. And there was a study done in The Lancet, very, very great um, journal. And what they found, they looked at 195 different countries across the globe and looked at all of these factors of what causes us to die early. And really, diet was the number one factor out of everything. And no surprise, as we've been talking about this morning, America is um, the highest, we consume the highest amount of processed and red meats. I think it's like 220 pounds or something like that a year. It's like insane to me. Um, but really these poor diets really come from uh, high salt, you know, low whole grain intake. They're not eating enough fruits, veggies, the, the nuts and seeds, okay? So what do we need to do? Whole food plant-based diet is really the only you know, dietary pattern that prevents, treats, and reverses chronic disease. I love this. This is from a study looking at you know, how, do we, how do we treat diabetes and really like reverse it. About 75% of, of the energy from that, that particular study was coming from carbohydrate. That's the reverse, I think, of what we've all been told um, with diabetes and you know, carbs are bad. It's just not true. And you can kind of see the unsaturated fats were kept low, but really high in phytochemicals, those antioxidants and nutrients. So really the choice is up to us. Um, we can kind of follow the standard American diet route, which is not so great, um, or go the whole food plant-based diet route, this anti-inflammatory disease preventing uh, dietary pattern, okay? Thank you, and references if anybody is curious. <laughs>So you touched on it a little bit in the beginning, like mental health and diet. Would you say that like the tips and like the 
vegetables that you mentioned near the end, are there ones that are be more beneficial to like help stabilizing mental health or ne neurodivergence? So that's a really good question. I think that they're starting to really look a little bit more at that. Um, I would say that all of them are good. Um, I, I hear a lot about leafy greens um, just being so incredibly, you know, helpful, beneficial um, to the brain and just really, I mean, every single organ system. Um, that's probably where I would start. But look at the, at the uh, there was the article before about the high... Um, antioxidants in different foods. You want to get them from foods like we've been talking about and not supplements, um, but color. That, that's really what represents the, the nutrients in our, in, our, you know, in, our, in our plants. So color is correlated with those antioxidants, reds, greens, purples, you know, blues even, if you want to call it that. Those oranges, yellows, those are the things that are going to really promote um, the brain health, um, gut health, heart health. We're all, all tied together. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's decreasing the sugar, um, the saturated fats, and that kind of thing that will also help. I just wanted to ask, like, comparably for people who do eat meat versus, like, switching over to meat substitute as their gateway drug, is there... It is. But, like, how does that fit into, you know, like, is there a benefit? So that's a really good question as well. So is there a benefit if you switch? So those meat substitutes, they're not all created equal. Um, you know, so I would look at that first. If you can find like one that is made with whole foods, then that's, that's great. But if it's something like an impossible burger, <laughs> yeah, exactly, the impossible burger, Here's what I would say, is that if you're switching, then that's a great thing. And if you're you know, relying a little bit more on those impossible burger products, that's still gonna be better than what we've seen. Just because we know um, of those a AGEs that we were talking about, like when you char meat, um, you know, red meat in particular, those things are very, very detrimental for gut health and all the other things we've been talking about. It is. It is still going to be better. They're going to be higher in salt, so they are more processed. It's not like a health food. I'm not sitting here saying like Impossible Burgers are great for you, but it's it's less bad. So I I don't necessarily um, follow a, a no soy. I eat a lot of soy. It's it's whole food, you know, soy. I I think that that's always the key is looking at the how it's made kind of thing. Um, I don't know that, that the Impossible Burger has soy in it. There is a lot of like processed soy in our, in our, in our foods, mm -hmm. but um, the, the sourcing, so how much processing has it, has it gone through? And potatoes, we talked about, you know, potatoes, potato chips, potato chips, not good, potatoes, good. So how, you know, what degree is it removed from its like most natural state is how I would think about that. How do you address uh, histamine intolerance? You know, there's definitely foods that will exacerbate that. And that's kind of something special that I would say probably only, you know, if you're having to deal with that, um, that you should follow something specific for. That's like kind of like IBS. Not all of those food recommendations are going to be okay for people with, with certain conditions. So really, that's a little bit more specialized. And absolutely, you should definitely um, go along those, <laughs> those lines. What foods calm sugar craving? Fiber. Will you eat fruit? Whole food plant-based. Take berries, take apples, take nuts. Okay. Those things are some of the best fiber. Does anybody have anything that they do specifically food-wise that helps with sugar cravings? Eating enough food. Yeah, eating enough food. So I work with a lot of athletes, and what I see a lot of the time is yeah. that when they don't eat enough, yeah. they crave sugar. That's 100%. So don't be afraid to eat carbs. Eat yeah. the whole grain, the veggies, that kind of thing. Stay away from the white bread because that's not going to keep you full, and then you're going to be... <laughs> dates. I heard dates. That's a good one. Dehydrated plantains. Yum. Oh, and dark chocolate. Yes. Yeah, so she was asking, are quinoa and brown rice, are they a good thing? So I'm going to let uh, Ms. Kabe take one more question, and then we'll get started. <laughs> so yes, I I'll say that, that they are. But I think when you're trying to really regulate, when they look at like you know, type 2 diabetes, it's keeping that fat very, very low. 
that that's the key and it's maybe 10 percent ish or so but really you want it from uh unsaturated sources and then you know fill up the fiber um so if you do have a little bit of of quinoa or brown rice like that's completely okay maybe you don't have like many, many cups, maybe more greens. And you know, you'll you'll start to have those microbes develop them in your gut that can then process those those different foods and they will help you um, with that blood sugar regulation. That's part of the the kind of the process. It takes time though. It does. And it's very, I think, scary for a lot of people like hearing this message of like carbs are not great, they're they're not good for blood sugar, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then switching, you're you're going against what you've heard for a long time, but it can work. So 